Effective decision-making comes from two things. Number one, understanding the nature of life itself, and number two, the nature of your relationship to other people. These two matters must be understood properly in order to effectively answer such questions as, who am I, where do I want to go in life, and how do I intend to get there? Unless those questions can be answered decisively, any decision that you make can never be firm. It's going to be subject to reappraisal tomorrow, the day after, the day after that, and you'll find yourself always in the position of reappraising your own decisions. But with a proper understanding of the nature of life itself and the nature of your relationship to others, you can understand any situation that develops. You can break down any situation to its component parts and see it on a basis that's completely comprehensible to you. You can make clear-cut decisions that will look just as good tomorrow as they do today. You'll never find it difficult to understand the actions of others, and you'll certainly never be surprised at your own reaction to situations that develop. Now, we can only accomplish this by going all the way back to the beginning and finding a premise, a starting point that is so self-evident that you can accept it. But I'm not going to pick one out of the air and say, well, we all know that this is true, or we can all accept this as a standard of right and continue on from that point. Rather, we're going to subject everything to the declaration, prove it, and thereby, I hope, ignore or at least block out every cliché that may have crept into my vocabulary or yours masquerading as a principle. It's not enough to say, thou shalt not steal. The question, why not, what are the consequences to me if I steal, must be answered once and for all. Proper decision-making and profitable living come from a clear-cut understanding of morality. Morality is the key to all important action because it is the basis upon which an individual makes his decision. You can construct a morality for yourself, but please note that I'm saying that you can construct it, not me. I cannot possibly construct a morality for you. Your mind is the supreme judge in your universe. It will be you that will have to decide, not me. And it's very easy for you to underestimate the worth of your own mind. As one grows in life, he sometimes throws off the shackles of the past, rejecting the authorities that he had accepted blindly as a child, for instance. And at that point, he begins to look down at those who base their principles and decisions on unproven creeds, and he feels himself superior because he has thrown that off. But it's too easy for the individual to then slip back into exactly the same framework under a brand new label. An individual finds a champion of freedom or individualism, and he finds it too comfortable then to simply accept the judgments of that person without subjecting the conclusions involved to the supreme test of his own mind. Is it right? Can I prove it to myself, to my complete satisfaction, that the individual has simply taken this because someone else has said it is so, no matter who that individual is, then the ideas are never really truth to the individual because he never really thought them out for himself. So where are we going to begin then? There's no better way to start than by recognizing the state of man at his birth, at the very beginning. Because a man is born into the world naked, physically and mentally naked. He has no knowledge, no morality, no goals, no standards, no values, no nothing. How could he? He hasn't yet soaked up any of the ideas that someday he will expound upon. And he has not yet been told by anyone what is right or what is wrong. And he certainly has developed no deep theories on the meaning of life or how to live life. The knowledge that he is someday going to talk about will be knowledge that will come to him in the future through observations of the world around him. But as he arrives, none of that exists in his mind. He knows not where he came from, where he's going, or how he's going to get there. All he has to guide him are his feelings. And by his feelings, I mean his mental reaction to what enters his world through the five physical senses. He will hear, smell, taste, feel, see things. But none of these things may have any significance to him whatsoever until he reacts to them. By what standard is he going to react to what he acquires through his five physical senses? Well, his mind has a built-in standard. He will quickly come to recognize within himself two diametrically opposed states of consciousness, the feeling of well-being and the feeling of discomfort. Now, I have no way of explaining how these phenomena are created physically in the brain. And, of course, neither is he when he first experiences them. But that isn't really important anyway. What is important is the simple fact of life that he recognizes that there are two different states of consciousness that he can feel. For whatever reason he is here, he becomes aware of the difference in his own mental attitude towards the environment around him. And that difference is spelled out in the feeling of mental well-being that he experiences at one time and the mental feeling of discomfort that he feels at another time. 
He notices that hunger creates a physical reaction in his stomach which gives him a mental feeling of discomfort, and he registers the fact that he doesn't like that as a result and would rather not be hungry. He recognizes that other things affect him, either with a feeling of well-being or discomfort. Now his mind is making the judgment for him, and he's going to react to the circumstances by automatically gravitating towards those circumstances that he feels will give him this feeling of well-being. And of course, he will try to stay away from anything that creates this feeling of discomfort or uneasiness within him. Happiness is the mental feeling of well-being. And of course, unhappiness then is the mental feeling of discomfort, or what von Mises has referred to as the state of uneasiness in one's life. Happiness is not a warm blanket, or a good dinner, or a million dollars. Happiness is the feeling of well-being that exists within the individual as a result of the things that happen outside of him in his life. So happiness may occur as a result of a warm blanket or a million dollars or a good dinner, but it is the specific sensation that exists within the individual that we're identifying here and labeling with the word happiness. In fact, we can establish our first premise in recognizing that every act that the individual takes is intended to bring about this feeling of well-being within himself. Now, you can say that the individual is seeking peace of mind or satisfaction or tranquility or stimulation or whatever, but all of these things are merely forms of the general phenomenon of mental well-being, and that is what the individual is trying to bring about. So we can sum up our first premise as being all individuals seek happiness. Now, I'm not saying that some individuals seek happiness or that individuals are usually seeking happiness, but rather that all individuals are seeking happiness at all times. I'm saying that no act is committed at any time for any purpose other than to bring about this feeling of well-being within the individual who's doing the acting. If I do you a favor, for instance, it is only because I intend to draw a feeling of well-being from it ultimately, or perhaps to avoid a feeling of discomfort that I think would otherwise exist if I didn't do the favor. Perhaps the dirty stares of all the people standing around watching me as I turn down this favor. And when you act, you are acting for your benefit and no one else's. In the process, you may very well be providing great benefits to other individuals, but they are only means to the end. They are not the purpose of the act. The only purpose the individual can have is to create the feeling of well-being within himself or to avoid discomfort. A good example of this from history is Giordano Bruno, who allowed himself to be burned at the stake rather than rejecting his ideas publicly and accepting the word of the church at that particular time. He had undoubtedly decided for himself that faced with these two alternatives, burning at the stake or living after having repudiated his own theories, he would find life unbearable, meaning unhappy if he were to renounce his views, and that death would actually be better than living a life of unhappiness, which he undoubtedly felt would follow having renounced his views. A suicide believes that he is faced with only two alternatives. Number one, a life of the pure unhappiness that he has been experiencing recently, or death, which to him is at least neutral and therefore would represent a gain over unhappiness. And so he feels that by killing himself, he has raised himself on the scale from unhappiness to at least neutrality, even if this didn't bring him positive happiness. The point is that in each case, the individual is acting for the avoidance of discomfort or the bringing about of a feeling of well-being. And if you believe that a man can engage in a really unselfish act, then just stand in front of him as he attempts to commit that act and see what happens. You will find that he will be very unhappy because you have prevented him from doing what he wanted to do. You will have created a feeling of discomfort within him by preventing him from engaging in this so-called unselfish act. The point being, then, that the individual did this because he expected to get well-being for himself. Consciously or unconsciously, the individual is evaluating every potential act, every object in his life, with the single question of, will this bring me happiness or unhappiness? His knowledge is going to be based upon his observations, his experience, and no one else's, and to expect it to be otherwise is unrealistic. In fact, it will be limited to his specific exposure to life. No one else has the benefit of your experience. No one else knows what you know, because each person is limited to what has entered his personal world through his own personal senses. Each person lives in a world of his own, bounded by his own knowledge. It's true that he is going to be able to visualize things that he has never seen outwardly in his own life, but the elements of that vision are going to have to be derived from his own experience. For instance, he can determine that two and three make five all by himself, but only after he has become acquainted with two and with three to use as the elements to make up five. 
And so each person is going to react to life in a little different way from the next person because each person is reacting in terms of that world that exists within the boundary lines of his own knowledge, his own experience. And that is how he will determine what is likely to bring him well-being. We can easily see then that each individual is going to seek happiness in a different way because each one is going to do it based upon his own purely subjective experience. In fact, it isn't just his belief of what will bring him happiness, but what actually does give him this feeling of well-being that will be different from one person to the next. One man may get a feeling of well-being from something that causes total discomfort to someone else, or at least may leave someone else neutral, because each person is the unique result of the experiences, events, and exposure that have made up his life.